Hello and welcome to Overexposed, the podcast from BWRN. In this podcast, Dave and I talk about all things related to running your own real estate photography business and hopefully we'll give you some useful tips and tricks to help make you successful and speak to some really cool people along the way. And this time we're going to be uh, we're going to be finding out some more details about Jackie, um, where she started, where she's uh, her journey, and um, and find out some tips if we can about her ideas on the customer experience. So, um, Jackie, do you want to start with just introducing yourself and telling us uh, what you do as a director of PWRM? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Jackie Kirk. I am the chief marketing officer of BWRM living in Narrabeen on the northern beaches of Sydney with my husband, Andrew, who you guys will probably encounter at some point. Um, he's also involved in the business. And my daughter, Aurora, who is two and is definitely not involved in the business. My role in BWM, it started off um, all things creating our brand, um, really trying to position us as a premium service. We wanted to be the good people, not the cheap people. So we wanted to design a brand around that. So I do a lot of work with our designers around that. Um, I work a lot on the social media management side of thing, um, a fair bit of work in member development now as well. Now that we've got teams running our social media and we've got some really good designers, um, I'm kind of moving more into creating structures to, to help our members stay engaged in their own businesses and to also put together some training um, and just community things that will help our members grow. And you, you've basically been responsible for the look of BWRM, really. I, I know you don't physically create the manuals um, yourself, but the look, the brand, the feel of the, the brand, that's all come from you, really, hasn't it? Yeah, a big part of it, I think. Um, I think I'd seen a lot of photography brands just look really clunky and um, and I have a background in graphic design and advertising and that sort of thing. So. I really just wanted something, you know, we're a visual marketing company and it's not a good look if we don't really know how to visually market ourselves. So we put a lot of time and energy into building that up and making it look, you know, shiny and nice and modern um, and aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, that looks great. So you you said you've got a background in design, but I mean, we're going back to not the very beginning. Um, We don't need to know uh, right from the start, but... um, well, you you grew up in Mauritius, or you're born in Mauritius, or I was born in Joburg, and my dad got a job in Mauritius when I was six, so we moved over there in 1992. Um, so I did all my primary schooling in Mauritius, went to high school in um, Joburg again, and then university in Cape Town, um, where I studied multimedia production. Which I think at high school my goal was to be a big movie director. So I went to University of Cape Town and did multimedia production, which is a bit of a catch-all course, which covered a bit of web design, a bit of coding, a bit of um, there was some animation in there, um, advertising, uh, did a lot in InDesign, Illustrator, not a huge amount in Premiere Pro, a bit in Photoshop, but yeah, it was just a bit of a, a catch-all, which at the time felt a bit wishy-washy, um, but now in hindsight has actually been really useful. I've used a lot of the stuff that I did on that course, which is nice. And so was the original appeal for you um, about, you know, design or was it about photography or was it about film or what What, what was the idea? It's quite funny. If you go back to, I actually, someone dug up, a friend of mine dug up our old high school yearbook from 2004 recently and she texted me and there was a page where it said, what do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself when you're 30? which seemed very, very old at the time. Um, And I'd answered, a lot of people had just answered, you know, married with children, blah, blah, blah. Um, And I think I'd said I'd be in an interesting place um, directing an interesting film about interesting things, Um, which is quite funny (laughs) as well. I'm in a place (laughs) and and we make films about things. Some, Some of the places we go to are very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and some people are interested in the things we make, so I don't know, not too far from the mark. Um, yeah, I think I think nailed, nailed it to be honest. So, so how did you get from um, Mauritius doing a design course to um, it was Wollongong you started in as photographer, wasn't it? How did you get from the one yeah. to the other? Um, so 
after uni, I got a job in Mauritius working for an ad agency and I thought it would be my dream job. Um, I thought I'd be doing really cool stuff and it actually wasn't. And I think anyone who's worked in an ad agency will kind of um, relate to that disillusion. (laughs) And Mauritius is a very small island. So if you're 22, um, it's, yeah, you can feel a little bit confined there. Um, So I decided to not do that job anymore and to go and just travel a bit to the ski season, um, working at a crash, um, met my husband, Andrew, and he wanted to play cricket in Australia. He'd lived here for a bit. And I was just like, yep, yeah, okay. Sounds interesting. Whatever. I was kind of very much, I'll go where the wind blows me at that time, young and free. And so we moved to Australia. Still, still looking for interesting places. Yeah, I guess so. Still looking for interesting places and just kind of wanting to, yeah, see what happened. It was, you know, I was young and I didn't have any reason not to. Um, So we moved to Wollongong because that's where he could, there was a club that wanted him to play for them. And then I just needed to find work. He had work coaching and I tried a few different things. I tried working at like the kiosk down by the beach. Actually didn't get that job, which still annoys me. (laughs) But Anyway, um, I saw an ad online for a real estate photographer and kind of imagine that I've got quite a romantic way of imagining the world sometimes I just imagine myself in front of these mansions just like doing the the finger squares the, you know what I mean like when you yep. yeah sorry I keep frames, yep. yeah the, the audio version everyone I'm doing finger frames with my hands right now um I just thought that'd be really cool but basically that job I had never heard of real estate photography either it wasn't a thing anywhere I'd been it like it made no sense to me um I had nothing to do with real estate ever. I loved photography. I, I was kind of a hobby travel photographer. But anyway, I saw this ad and it was for a woman who had a franchise in Wollongong and she needed a contractor, but she also wanted that contractor to pick up new clients. She earned a certain percentage of what she invoiced and then she paid me a certain percentage of that, which was very, very little. When I look back at it now, it was probably would have made more working at the fish and chip shop. Or definitely would have made more work in the fish and chip shop. But um, except, she, except she, apparently they wouldn't have given you the job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One small detail, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyway, she trained me as a backpacker or someone like you know we were living in a share house. A whole other story, but. Um, as a backpacker earning, you know, what ended up being around $40 a job seemed like a lot of money at the time. So she trained me, which was the best thing is I worked for her for free for a very long time, for weeks and weeks, actually learning the trade. She did quite well out of me, built up the business, did a bit of marketing for her, did a bit of sales, which again, I had no idea at all what I was doing. And I can remember like having done a full day of meeting with agents and just having the door like literally and figuratively slammed in my face, um, sitting in my car in tears, just thinking like, what am I doing? This is horrible. But I persevered mainly because I didn't have any other options because the fish and chip shop wouldn't have me. Um, <laughs> so so and, just, just, going, just going back a step, just two things before I, before I forget. Yeah. What was the appeal for you of the photography? and Because it's, Similar to our discussion about, you know, coming from a, being a coder to, to going out on site and things, I don't know what, what designers in uh, ad agencies do all day, but um, I, I've got an idea, but I won't go into it. Um, it just involves coffee and sitting around. But what was the appeal of the real estate photography or the photography compared to, presumably you wanted to be in design, so? I wanted to be in advertising, but there wasn't anything in Wollongong in advertising. I would have gone, had to go to the city. And... I just kind of thought I'd do anything, to be honest. I've done a lot of weird jobs. Like I've been like a clown. I've been a lot of odd things. Um, And I I like, yeah, (laughs) yeah. Um, I liked taking photos. I was already really enjoying photography when we'd been traveling before we'd moved to Australia. I'd kind of had a go at being a travel photographer and writer. I'd done a bit of a course on that and I'd done a bit of blogging. So I really, I really enjoyed doing photography so as soon as I saw a job available that had photography in it I thought that's cool like that seems fun and interesting 
Yeah, and I suppose the contrast, I would imagine when you're in the ad agency, you have no control over what you're working on or how exciting the project is or any of that kind of stuff. So actually being given the creative freedom to go and do things yourself is probably an appeal as well. Yeah, in hindsight. But at the time, honestly, I needed work. Photography seemed cool and it was as simple as that. And I spent like the last of my money, bought the gear, and I just I had to make it work. And I also, I don't really give up on things. So, yeah, I kind of just, I'll flog that dead horse until I've tried every last thing to make it work. Um, yeah, I don't usually quit unless it's taking up running, which I do. So, yeah, this running, <laughs> running. Um, that's how I invented the car. Um, so talking about flogging a dead horse, you said that it was difficult to sell. Did, did you have any background uh, of sales or um, where does the sort of gift of a gap come from? I had absolutely nothing um, in terms of technical sales training. Um, I think one of the things that helped me was having grown up in Mauritius, most people are there on two-year contract. Well, most expatriate people are there on two-year contract. So a lot of the people I met, you had to become really good friends with really quickly because they were going to leave in two years and then there'd be a new person and you'd have to become friends with them really quickly or you just have no friends. So I learned really quickly to connect with different people on different things. And that's a really big part of what we still do today. And it's a big part of what we'll talk about, which is the vendor experience when you go into a home and how you make people comfortable. And the same with building relationships with agents is you you can find something to talk about something in common um, with most people. And if you can do that and kind of connect with them on that level, they see you as a person and they want to use you. I think it's what you said, Dave, when we interviewed you, you can't sell something to someone if they don't want to buy it. But if they like you, they want to buy what you're selling. And, and it's the same as with your photos, which is another thing we should discuss later, is if you can make them like you on site, then they are very likely to like your photos, no matter how they look, to some degree. Yeah. So. Anyway, to answer your question, it was gift of the gab. It was being able to connect with people. I had a little bit of coaching. I remember that's actually when I met you, Dave, was when I worked in Wollongong. And I think you were a really big mentor at that stage. Um, I'm only going to say this once, so enjoy it. Um, This is is being recorded. Yeah. (laughs) But, no, you helped me a lot. I remember, yeah, emailing you at all hours for all sorts of help and, um, yeah a lot of advice from you, which was huge. And having that kind of, that was my support, which was really good. It sounds like your main sales technique um, was having the gift of the gab and stubbornness, really. Yeah, yeah. Gift of the gab, stubbornness. Also, I... And needing the money, (laughs) really. The money, yeah, yeah. And I wanted to be good. I think I come from a very artistic family. So you and I often joke that, like, I'm all arty-farty and you're very kind of... um, rules and technical side of things and like you can talk to me about gear I don't I like I can I can talk about gear but it's so boring and I don't want to it bores the shit out of me to talk about like what camera are you using I don't care but I will talk to you for ages about little tweaks you can make to your composition that make a photo feel right and and what makes it feel right so that's kind of my history is my grandmother was um an art teacher and I've got my auntie's an architect, like lots of artists in my family. And so from a very young age, we were taught about composition and like our drawings were critiqued. You take a five-year-old drawing, you're like, mm, you haven't really kept the viewer's eye on the page in the right way. Um, well, I, just got, I just got mine put on the fridge and that was the end of it. Oh, no. No, they had to be good to go on the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, so there was an artistic nature, so I really enjoyed that part of it. And I think taking that sort of care and wanting to be good at it also helped me. I really, really wanted to be very good at it. I'm quite competitive and I, I wanted to be the best. So, Yeah. All right. And so you, you find yourself in Wollongong um, working for someone else. How do you get from there to uh, Northern Beaches and, and what sort of differences and challenges did you have getting from one to the other? Because I imagine they're completely different areas. Yeah. So um, I eventually bought the franchise from the person in Wollongong. I built that up, sold that franchise. Um, because an opportunity came up for a bigger franchise in South Sydney. I did that very briefly. At that point, 
in South Sydney, my role wasn't so much in being a photographer, it was in selling franchises. And that's when I started to see that the franchise model wasn't really something that I wanted to promote to other people. So um, I just thought, you know, I, I just kind of thought back to, you know, for me in Wollongong earning an absolute pittance, but working my ass off like we didn't we didn't have retouches. So I would go out, shoot, you know, 10 jobs in a day, some days, come home, literally be up until three o'clock in the morning editing them myself, send them off. And then by the time I'd paid for all my insurance and everything, just made an absolute pittance. It wasn't worth it. And yeah, I just saw that the, the kind of model didn't really suit the person doing all the work and it works for some people but it just wasn't for me so left the franchise moved up to the northern beaches Andrew my husband and I had been doing a bit of drone work in the northern beaches because back then you needed to have a drone license to fly a drone and you needed to do like a massive course to get that license it was really expensive and cricket coaching doesn't pay a huge amount um so he'd been doing my drones and had done that course. So we were one of a handful of people that could do drone in Sydney at the time. And he was, we were getting sent up to the Northern beaches. Um, we just really fell in love with the area. So when I left the franchise, we decided we'd move up here and I would have a go at starting my own business here. By that point, I'd met um, Guy, Nick and you I'd known for a while. And that was kind of around when Guy was formulating his idea for BWRM. and. When I heard it, I said to him, I love this. I'd really like to be involved in this. And that kind of, yeah, that was the beginning. Um, yeah. What a really cool thing. So as, a, as a, a business owner, though, the differences between, I mean, I, I've, I think I'm pretty sure I've driven through Willing and it seems like a sort of industrial type town. How did you, to me, anyway, or maybe, maybe it's just a bit I drove through, but um, – was there a big difference in the housing stock and the attitudes and all that kind of between the two? Like, did you have to, you know, change the way yeah. you did things or? Yeah, massively. Um, so Wollongong is actually lovely. It's a really nice place and the people are great. And it's it's on the rise because it's so close to Sydney. But at the time that I was there, there was a there was a pretty, like, you, you move stuff on site, but it was a much more relaxed standard of real estate photography. So we moved things, but we we didn't, you know, go nuts then I moved up here into quite a competitive market we had the benefit of video and drone which was really our number one sales point and how we got into most offices I now have but when it came to photography there were some really good photographers up here and they were guys that just had the most insane attention to detail and we were working on like houses that were worth 10, 12 million dollars. Um, so the stakes were really high for everyone involved. And I thought I was doing a pretty good job. And I remember going to a shoot us, it was just they hadn't been able to get their number one guy. This was way back when I was really starting out and just really busting my ass to get clients. And I'd set up the room, I'd moved so much stuff and I was thinking, okay, I'm doing this well. And the agent was like, oh, um, you're not gonna Turn the cushions over. I can see the zips. Now the photographer always makes sure the zips aren't visible. And I was like, oh my God. It was like that level of detail. Um, but that's what I had to do. And what I did was I was like, okay, if that's what matters to the agents is that attention to detail, then I am going to ram attention to detail down their throats. I'm going to become the attention to detail gal. Um, so it wasn't just that I would turn the cushion over, I would announce it. I'd be like, oh, like you set up the camera and it's become a bit of a trick that I use now where you set up the camera, then you pause and you look around and you see if anything needs doing and even if it doesn't, just do something and say, oh, I'm just going to turn the cushion around. Oh, that blind just seems like, you know, a couple of centimetres not aligned with the other blind, just going to straighten those. And doing all of that stuff, the agents go, whoa, I didn't even notice that. Jeez. And the owners even like more importantly sometimes they go geez this person's really taking their time they're putting a lot of care into what they're doing here and that yeah just that was probably one of the best things I learned to do was not just the attention to detail but to make it really really obvious that I was paying attention to detail 
Yeah, I've sort of thought in the past that you can, there's like a hurry up and go slowly type um, thing that you can do where it feels like it should take a lot longer doing all of those things. But by doing that, you're showing the owner and the agent that you know what you're doing and that that will give them the confidence to just let you get on with things, which allows you to get stuff done quicker. Is that, is that what you yeah. know? Yeah. And you're just more likely to have them happy with the, the finished product. I had a situation, I've had two situations recently that illustrate this. I had one where I had a contractor go and do a shoot and straight after the shoot they called me and they were like, oh, we're not, we're not sure about the contractor, we're not too happy. And I saw the, I was like, okay, well, why not? And they're like, oh, we're just, we're not sure. We're just a vibe. And that was really annoying because I couldn't have something specific to talk to my contractor about. And this contract is really good. Like I trust him with all my clients. And I checked the photos when they came back the next morning and they looked great. There was nothing I would have done differently. But the owner sent the agent an email saying they could have taken better shots on their iPad. And then the agent rang me and I said, yep, don't worry. I'll be right back and reshoot it. I went back and did the reshoot, but I knew that this was an owner thing. This was owner driven, that for whatever reason, the owner hadn't been comfortable and if you're prepped to not like something, you're not going to like it. You know, it's, yeah. If my mum tells me she's found a dress that I'm going to love, I'm automatically not going to like it. But if I, find <laughs> the, yes, if I find the exact same dress next week, then I'm like, oh, it's beautiful, um, which is not very fair to my mum. So if she's listening. I'm very sorry about that. But um, anyway, I went back to this house. I really worked on the vendor. I said, look, this is your home. You know better than anyone what's going to sell it. What do you like? Show me. What don't you like? Ran, checked every photo with her. I literally, I'm not joking. You can put the photos I took side by side with the ones my contractor took and it's almost identical. I yeah. almost took the identical photos. I did some minor, minor tweaks, which I made a big song and dance about. But it was purely talking to the owner. And then she went back to the agent, oh, these are much better. We love them. They're so much better thanks to the reshoot. And it was like the only thing that had changed was her experience on site. So talk me through, um, I've done some high-end properties and I know that you don't only do high-end properties, but um, you're in a very expensive area. There's going to be a high average price. There's going to therefore be some very high end and very high, highly expensive properties. You turn up at a you know twenty five million dollar um, mansion on the beach or something. What's the what's your process from sort of getting out the car to to getting to the stage where this person? It's a huge investment from their point of view. They're selling their their biggest asset. How do you turn up and make them feel comfortable that you're going to do a great job? So first of all, I make sure I know that there's a really high-end property coming up because it will go through the personal assistant. And a property like that, what time of day you shoot it is absolutely crucial to getting photos that are fine versus photos that are knock your socks off. And so if I can see that it's been booked in the wrong time, I call the agent beforehand and I say, look, we can do it at this time if that's when it's going to be, but I strongly recommend you do it early or late or whatever. So, um, yeah, assuming that it's all been booked for the perfect time, I show up at the property, introduce myself, make sure I've booked enough time for a shoot that's a high-end shoot. Um, so something Neil Cash says he does, he always books an extra 15 minutes for chit-chat if he knows it's going to be a property that's going to need chit-chat. Yeah. Um, you don't want to seem rushed. Even if you are rushed, you don't want to look like you're rushing because, again, their perception is no matter what, the photos they see are going to be photos that they felt were rushed, so they're going to look rushed, whether yep. they look rushed or not. You know, take a wander through the house. If it's a really high end property, you'd hope that it's styled and there's not much to move. But just chat to the owners, compliment them on their beautiful home. Depends on the owner. Some people are really private and just want to leave you to it. So you go, oh, where are you moving? And they don't actually want to tell you. But some people want to chat to you for ages and will follow you around, chatting to you about all sorts of things. You kind of need to gauge what the owner is going to like and what's going to make it a really good experience for them. And something that's always stuck with me, and this doesn't matter how expensive the house is or whatever, is Nick Tonzing said to me once that he always feels like it's an absolute privilege to be allowed into someone's home to photograph it. It's someone's home. It's their safe place. Um, it's the biggest asset. And they're allowing you, a stranger, 
go in and you should treat it like a privilege and be extremely respectful of people. So that means, and the other thing you've got to remember is you might be shooting, you know, three or four properties that day. This is their home that they've lived in for 20 years. They're selling it once. It's a really stressful process. You need to be empathetic to that and make them feel like you care about it as much as they do and that you're going to do everything you can to get them their best results. So you don't make it about you, you make it about them. And that's something that your clients will see and really appreciate. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. You know, when you, you've you got to look at it from the vendor's point of view as well as yourself. Obviously, you've got, you know, from your point of view, you may have done 20 houses already this week. Um, you may have, you know, another five jobs to get to. But from their point of view, it's their one house, their biggest asset. It's It's a critical transaction. So you do have to balance that. Yeah. it's so, And if you want to be retaining those clients, those are the things that get your clients coming back to you. It's not how good the picture looks. It's I have a I have one agent who in particular lists a lot of high-end stuff and it's that flexibility and giving him that small business feel. I shot one recently. I think it was like a $12 million house and I got there to shoot it. It was sunny. It was morning. It was all organized. The stylist and I, it literally took us about 40 minutes to open all the blinds and the doors and get it all. It was styled, but it was just huge. Um, by the time we'd gotten everything ready, it had become overcast and it had ocean views. And I just like, I said, I can shoot it. We can drop in blue skies. But I rang the agent and I said, if you've got time up your sleeve, if it were me, if this were my house, I would come back for it um, and I would do it beautifully in the best weather because you only kind of get one shot at, you know, doing this sort of house. And that's if you've got a really high-end house and I've built that sort of flexibility into my pricing that I'm not necessarily out of pocket, that there is, I have like in the high-end package pricing for um, some flexibility and that sort of thing. If it's a smaller house, obviously, you've got to treat it like, go specific to what that house needs but in this case if you ask me about high-end stuff that flexibility is something the agents really want because those high-end owners are used to being treated as if they're the only person on the planet um and they need to have a good experience yeah awesome and so um you're at the stage now where uh you're running a business with contractors how do you get you know with that level of attention to detail and um customer service uh, customer experience and stuff how do you how do you find the right people? How do you get them to understand that, um, you know, this is not just transactional? I mean, you're the business owner, but they're a contractor. And so how do you get, how do you train people and how do you get the right people? How do you get that across? Oh, my God, good question. Um, it's really, really, really hard. I'm really lucky that I've got a very good team. It's taken me a long time to get a group of people that I trust. I think... No one who works for you as a contractor is going to care as much as you do. That's just not, that's not going to happen. It's important that when you're looking for contractors, you know what's easy to teach and what's difficult to teach. So I can teach a contractor the settings. I can teach them how to use a camera. I, it's really hard to teach them to care um, and to be able to make people feel comfortable. So I, I try to look for contractors that are personable, that are, receptive to learning that I'm not going to have to say the same thing to 30,000 times. Most of my contractors came with some sort of skill. So both of my videographers knew what they were doing with video. I just needed to show them the settings and then they've had to live their game working for these really high-end agents as well. I've got one contractor that's recently started and he reminds me of you a little bit actually. He's he's a bit He's a bit less like smiley and bouncy than my other contractors um, and he, he doesn't do fake small talk, but he is Mr. Attention to Detail almost to the point of being extremely annoying about it, which is perfect. So, um, <laughs> um, no, but I mean, he, he won't be fake to you. He's not a phony guy and he's not going to make small talk about the weather. He'll make you feel comfortable and he'll be polite and professional but where he shines is he'll set up the camera and he'll go, no, nope, and he'll pick up an armchair and move it out of the shot and go and get a plant from downstairs and bring it upstairs and put it in the shot. He goes to that level of effort. And to be honest, the agents don't care then if he's chatting to them about the weather or the football or whatever because yep. 
is making so much effort. And then it's just about making it a nice job for your contractors to have, paying them on time, giving them enough work, giving them constructive feedback, telling them when they've done a good job. I ask my agents a lot how it's going with them. I get a lot of agent feedback on site to say, how was it with so-and-so yesterday? You know, I'm always trying to work on my team, which is really nice. The agents appreciate that. They feel like I care. But, yeah, it's difficult. Where did the contractors come from? Were they all the videographers or where did you find them? Um, Most of them were actually recommended to me. When I needed a contractor, I just started asking anybody who I came in contact with, do you know anyone who's a great videographer or a great photographer? So one of my my videographer, Mike, he's the brother-in-law of an agent and I gave him a call. He was keen. Another one contacted us via the website actually looking for work, so that was really good. That was the WM brand having my back there, right? Another one was recommended by Melissa, who's in Canberra. She knew her and she raved about her, so I contacted her. One came from another BWR member. But they, all of these people were already photographers or videographers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. doing something. Like I've, I've tried to upskill them. Um, so I did a training day, um, a video training day to train all the photographers how to take video. I've trained the drone video guys in Twilights and one of them in floor plans. Most of them came from word of mouth. Most of them had existing skills. And, yeah, I think the main thing is if you're doing contractors, you need to have a pipeline. Even if you don't have the work, you need to have backup because – contractors move and they change and then you're kind of left in the shit. So having backup is really important. Yeah, sounds good. So um, last question then, um, and I won't ask the what's the worst shoot you've done a thing, but I will ask what's your, what has been your favourite shoot or most memorable shoot or what, what's your favourite type of job to turn up to? Um, most, memorable, most memorable shoot. Most maybe. memorable. I don't know. I shoot so I shoot some really beautiful houses. Often it's it's made nice by the people I meet as well. Um, if I just have a nice, it's about my experience too. If, if it's nice vendors and the house is nicely presented, then I'm happy and I'm going to do better as well. The one I probably talk about the most is I shot Kate Blanchett's holiday home in Barara which was really cool. I didn't get to meet Kate, but there was a portrait of her in the room and it was her house. So It's close enough. Yeah, and that was really nice because went out to Barara Waters and took a boat over. The house was only accessible by boat. And, um, yeah, the guy that manages it took us back to the ferry on the boat and gave Mike and I, who was doing the video for me, um, beers on the boat on the way back. That was just fun. Um, but I've, like, I've travelled to Cowra to do a motel. Um, Oh, I did one for Anthony. That was fun. I flew to Queensland to help Anthony Caligari when he just just started, and that ended up being the house that only recently its record was broken, but it was at a, at the time the most expensive house in Queensland. And Gina Reinhardt now owns it. That was fun, and we just did the whole day. So they're exhausting those shoots, but they are memorable. Where you're doing like sunrise to sundown, and you're pulling out all the stops, and you just get shots that you're really really pleased with um yeah that was a pretty cool one too and so very last question have you had a call yet from anybody to go back and shoot that kiosk that wouldn't give you a job in the first place (laughs) uh no which is good (laughs) because i'm not photoshopping the grease off the floor (laughs) it's their loss i'm sure yeah i got fleas from a house in wollongong once that was cool Nice. Literally got fleas. <laughs> so bad. But also shot some really nice ones there. But yeah, that's uh... good stuff. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jackie. I think that's that's been really interesting for me. I hope it's been interesting for you guys listening. And we will see you next time. See ya. See ya.